So I'm going to talk about Cambo. Uh, that is the story of a frog, a frog in the Amazon. And uh, I hope to, like in the other talk, deconstruct some stereotypes and some kind of mystified views that circulate around, which are rather inaccurate. This was a paper that I did in 2005, and recently I updated it uh, with a, a publication in English that will come up in January in the Anthropology Journal of USP, the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, so it's partly based on that paper, but not everything is on the paper. The paper is co-edited co with Egileni Kofasi de Lima, who is an anthropologist who has studied uh, the, Kashina, the Katukina people, Pano-speaking group, uh, and she's an expert on, on that. She did her master's and her PhD on that. And I study rur urban reinventions of the use of traditional drug use. So it's a combination of our expertises. Me being more friendly and open to this kind of new age hybrid reinventions and her being traditionally involved with indigenous populations. So partly is um, based on that. So the, the, the talk is rather uh, inclusive. This is an outline from history to classifications and doing some reflections on set and setting. What, what, what does this make us think about our use of drugs and how can we think reflectively and critically about this and what does Cambo shed a light for us to think on those things? What is drug? What is set? What is setting? What is chemical properties? What is subjectivity? Uh, personal intentions and context and so forth. So I think it was meant to be a large, uh, dense, detailed reflection, but I'm going to try to make it a little bit faster because I think it's, uh, the venue is a little bit more dynamic than I had envisioned. So, but anyway, uh, I'm open for further questions after. So this is the, the frog. What do the, a lot of uh, Katukina and uh, Kashinawa, Yawanawa, other groups do? They catch the frog, they hold the frog, and they, they touch the, the head of the frog with a little stick, and then the frog expels the venom. So they collect the venom in a, a little piece of uh, wood called palieta, and this becomes dried, kind of crystallized. And then afterwards, when they're going to apply it in a person, they um, heat it up and then they get a, a, a vine called sipochichica and make some holes in the person. And then they apply the substance over the skin of the person. That's the, the holes I'm talking about. That's uh, somebody that I know, actually me, <laughs> uh, having application on my arms. Uh, this is right, the first one is right it in the beginning, and then this is how it was stayed afterwards. So just a general uh, overview. Frogs are fundament have a fundamental role in many cultures. They are frequently considered a repellent animal, but they, are, they can be uh, associated to things like poison, fertility, magic potion, diabolic force, remedy, amulet. You have examples of the use of, of frogs in different times and cultures, for example, in Maya culture, in China, in Vietnam, or perhaps a more close example to all of us in European prehistoric mythology. It was also associated to the use by witches and alchemists since the 15th century. Okay, the frogs are a member of the amphibians families. It's 350 million years, I, I think that gives us a great perspective or, of our existence on Earth. Uh, in 1925, this uh, missionary, French missionary, Tastevin, I don't know how to say his name, he ob observes the use of the frog, Cambo. Cambo is in Portuguese. In Pano, it would be Campo. I'm using the Portuguese version here. Among the Kashinawa people. Uh, a little bit about this species. This, this species is part of the phy, uh, Philomedusa uh, gen. It's subfamily, you have it there. It's a gen with four species. The bicolor, so it's Philomedusa bicolor is the, the name of, the scientific name of Cambo, it is the, the, mo, uh, the most well known. 
The venom affects the central nervous system. And then in 1985, uh, Sparmer uh, studied the active peptides. This is uh, part of the studies that are being conducted with the peptides. I just want to make a disclaimer that Cambo is frequently related to Bufo alvarius, which is another frog. So it's not the same frog. This is important that you understand. This Bufo alvarius is a frog found in Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. That uh, frog is the one that has 5-MEO DMT. So Cambo is not that frog. I would like you to understand that. This frog is, is, is famous because the substance is like five times stronger uh, than DMT. It's this, the same uh, substance found in, in plants like Anadentera peregrina and in South American snuffs. Uh, the Bufo alvarius product, the, the, the venom of this other frog produces intense psychedelic experiences of short duration. This generated a, move, a movement uh, that in uh, 1984 there was, uh, was known as the, 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 the rays of this church known as the psychedelic Todd of the Sonor Sonoran Desert, which was a cult in veneration to the Bufo Alvarius. It was a small movement, it had a short duration, but I think it's very interesting. This is the, you can see it's a pretty different frog. That was the Church of the Todd of the Light. Uh, this is a very interesting thing, which is like the rays of psychedelic um, modalities or drug-related religious phenomenon that try to uh, uh, sue the government or approach the government to have religious status. So we have published another book, which is called uh, Prohibition, Human Rights, and religious freedom, regulating traditional drug use. And we make a kind of reflection on which, uh, which were the phenomena that, which were the cultural expressions that try to have status as legitimate religious movements. So there's a range of modalities from Til Timothy Leary, who started his uh, LSD church, which was the, legal, the, the League of Spiritual Discovery, to things like this, uh, or Hastafari, or peyote, some of which got religious status and some of which didn't get, some of which were uh, active parodies of religion, uh, like this one that had a, a, a can opener as the main symbol of the religion and Puff the Magic Dragon as their main religious hymn. From, from radical parodies uh, to just uh, uh, spontaneous gatherings of people that uh, for example, decided to, to, to plea uh, recognition as a marijuana uh, religious modality and so forth. So this, was a, this is a little parenthesis just to contextualize that there's a, a much larger discussion involving regulation of this uh, sort of expression. Uh, so this is related to the Bufo Alvarius, not to the Cambo, but I wanted to put out there because it's important that we have this in perspective. The Cambo is not related to a religious modality that has claimed, uh, that claims this kind of recognition, but it's within the same, let's say, semantic field of this discussion. So what are the traditional uses of the Cambo? The Cambo, there you go again, in the Amazon. You have at more than 10 groups that use Cambo in the border of Bra uh, Peru and Brazil. Cambo is especially important about the, uh, among the Pano family. For example, these are some indigenous groups that probably you heard of. Katukina, Kashinawa, Yawanawa, Ashaninka, Mawaka, Yaminawa, Marubu, Machis, Matses, uh, Chikuna, Kulina, Kanamari. So like the Shipibo became kind of like the representatives of ayahuasca, but there's a bunch of people that use ayahuasca. This happened with the Katukina people. And that's where my co-authorship with this particular anthropologist comes into play because she's an expert on Katukina. Uh, so you have these indigenous uses and like ayahuasca too, there are many parallels, you have a culture of mestizo rubber tappers that use it. So it's like riverine mixed blood uh, populations and among the mestizo, this is called the frog injection, vacina de sapo, 
So you also hear sapo or cambo or vacina de sapo in Portuguese. So what is the use of cambo? Now I really would like you to understand this. If you understand this, I'll be happy with my lecture. To combat panema. What is panema? Panema is bad luck in hunting. You go, you go out to the woods. You're a man, you have a family, you go out hunting. Find no game, go again. Next day, find no game, go again. Next day, find no game. So perhaps you have panema. Panema is a kind of magical state, a kind of, uh, perhaps if you broke some taboos, like you, you uh, hunted more species than you should, or you didn't do the correct pacts with the masters of the games, like you didn't negotiate properly with the shamans of the, uh, of the species you're supposed to, to hunt, or you didn't uh, peel the, the, the game in the correct way and put the bones in the correct manner, you disrespected certain rules, you might become impanemado, which is to have this bad luck in hunting. And bad luck in hunting is bad luck in love because no meat, no women, you can't provide. I think everybody can relate to that. So they also use pane, uh, uh, cambo to, uh, to apply for the dogs that go hunting together with the, with the hunter. So this is one side of cambo. The other side is to combat laziness that in Pano receives the name of tickish. So, the interesting idea of tickish, it's not like it's morally reproachable in a Christian way, like maybe for us, because you lack productivity or so, but it's more about a lack or a refusal to engage socially, to interact, to participate. So it's a, a kind of rejection of social life, rejection of this interchange. Uh, so Cambo is also used for this. And generally speaking, it's used among uh, the Pano people to inver invigorate, to fortify, something that it's common about uh, in even like just rural poor people in Brazil, this idea that you're skinny and you should be fat and strong, like that's a sign of vitality, of health, because it's also very um, poor. So it's, Cambo is used to invigorate, to give this energy. What are the modes of application? Like ayahuasca and other substances, you have old traditional ways and then you have a dynamic change uh, on how these things are used. So perhaps old uses were related to sniffing, rapé, rapé is uh, snuff, no? Or used in water. And then you have the points. The points is how many holes you make to apply combo. So naturally, if you make five, you have one effect. If you have make seven, you have more effects. So the, the points can vary, and there's this whole grammar of masculinity and of braveness related to making points. So for example, when I uh, interview a, a Katukina person, the, he was talking and then he said, like, let's cut the, the, the bullshit and let's get to the mad facts pull his shirt and like <laughs> combo many, many points. So it's also related, it's this kind of male solidarity, men between themselves, this kind of, uh, and it also depends, like depending on the tribe, you can put it on the leg for the women and on the uh, arm for men. This, there's a whole uh, variation to it. Oops, oh sorry. In children, you can have a uh, few points, and you usually apply it at dawn, at dawn, and you have a night diet. What are the effects? What everybody also wants, always wants to know. Intense, short-lasting uh, effects. So let's say that five very, very intense minutes. Nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, fever, headache, tachycardia, chills. So basically the heart goes fast, uh, sweating, maybe a headache, profound nausea, but short, maybe the whole thing, 30 minutes. And then this is very interesting, it's a, something that I, I always like to take to psychedelic meetings, which is the idea that every drug has its counter 
cut effect. So whenever people take a drug, they should know what counters that drug. Because all drugs have this kind of partner which are cutting down the effects of drugs. I think that's a very like small you know, knowledge that we, we frequently lack. So a cold bath is said to be a good way to cut off the effects. Now, this is also very interesting. There's a whole relationship between the person who applies and the person who receives. Who is the person who applies? It's an experienced hunter or a hard-working woman. So a man hunter will apply to a man younger hunter, and an experienced uh, woman will apply to a younger one. So for example, you're a young woman, you just got married, you're feeling all those challenges about married life, all those obligations, that obligation of performing your sexual duties, that obligation of cooking and of uh, washing and everything. So maybe an older woman will come to your house and apply Cambo to you. Because the idea is that the, the person who applies pass on moral qualities to the person who receives it. So by applying Cambo, I receive that those moral attributes which are inherent to that person. Note, this is very different than being an expert or a shaman in the knowledge of Kambo. I hope you understand. It's about who you are and what you know, and then you can pass that on to the person who receives it. So very interestingly, it's not surprise, surprising that self-application by older people only. If you're old, who's going to teach you more, right? So you can apply to yourself. doesn't make a sense that somebody else apply to you. So this also involves a long-term relationship with the person who applies it. And this is also important, the last point. It's not about the esoteric, shamanic knowledge. It's the knowledge about this is public. It's part of an implicit tradition. It's like when you have a flu or perhaps uh, drank too much and everybody has that little tip. Uh, it's kind of this daily uh, in-house medicine. It's not, a, it's not related to the shaman, and it's not related to some esoteric knowledge. It's kind of a popular remedy. That's another one of the Cambo. He's very phosphorant. Okay, what happened regarding the urban expansion? So we, we see ayahuasca and ayahuasca's expansion. But Cambo is, is, is neat because one can trace it in, in one's own lifetime. So I, I, when I was in Brazil, I saw this. I was witness of this process myself. Uh, this guy named Francisco Gomes, he lived among the Catuquina people. He was a rubber tap in, uh, in Acre. And in the mid-90s, he started to bring Cambo out of the village. So this is very recent. And then this progressively came, started to be used by an urban clientele. Things like holistic therapy, therapy clinics and the New Age religious movements of Brazil that are known to you perhaps as the Santo Daime and the Union do Vegetal. In this new context, Cambo is brought up, is, is conceptualized, is classified as a treatment. And then this is super interesting because when it arrives in these new urban centers, people take Cambo and they start to report having visions with Cambo. This is a whole new grammar and a whole new way of classifying Cambo. So Cambo becomes within this realm like of, of kinship, of affinity, of, of similarity with alternative therapies or the idea of teacher plants or master plants or psychedelics or uh, substances that are uh, visionary or that uh, cause people to do self-reflection and things like that. So Peyo, uh, Cambo is associated in the urban imaginary with things like ayahuasca, magic mushrooms, uh, peyote. This, for example, is a pamphlet, Medicina Indígena da Floresta. Indigenous medicine of the forest, indications, Cron uh, uh, contraindications, diet. So this is like a new age therapy center that you know uses a little aesthetic of pano drawings. 
and has this mix of treatment with some scientific language. This is an advertisement of a clinic that is offering combo treatments. So my friend Egilene, for example, she did like two, 15 years of fieldwork, masters, uh, PhD, and she said that she went many times to Katukina villages and she never really saw any big deal around Cambo. So she was particularly shocked to see this Cambo arisal and that really irritated her as, a, as an ethnologist who is the, the part of the anthropology that in studies indigenous groups and she thought it was all flaky. And the, the, the article is a dialogue between us and then again me kind of trying to give legitimacy to to this sort of thing, to understand, to classify, to a curious question, what is going on? Though I do understand her view too. Okay, so there was this big, big boom and this big story. I'm gonna go here through 10 years in one slide. Let's say that the 2000s were the boom of Cambo. In 2003, the Katukina write a letter to the Ministry of Environment. They want to make like a research about Cambo and maybe a Cambo related medicine or, or where, on where they would have benefits. That's a very kind of interesting story that I'll pass here shortly. And in 2004, the Anvisa, Anvisa is our board that regulates drugs and like give out the lists the famous bureaucrats that sit somewhere in an office and outrule substances and put, classify them in forbidden. So uh, Anvisa releases a note, not a, a, against exactly outlawing Cambo, but against the marketing of Cambo. So you, ha you cannot say Cambo heals cancer, Cambo heals HIV, Cambo heals depression or premenstrual tension. So uh, the site of that one particular therapist who started to do all this movement, which was that pamphlet that I showed, they took the site down, for example. In 2006, the New York Times gave a story about Cambo. And then in 2006, the Katukinas who had made an alliance with this one particular therapist and then with a bunch of others and had started touring Brazil. So I was in Sao Paulo and all of a sudden there was this commission of Katukina people come into the city. It was quite exciting times and we would visit them and there was rapé and there was good conversations and there was cambo and all of a sudden like the pact fell and they got super angry, super pissed off with the therapists because in a way they were fundamental and strategic in legitimizing the introduction but eventually the, there was a movement where the urban therapists became themselves the people who applied and kind of got rid of the Indians. So that's one side of it. The other side is that some people got to be more, travel more and make money and have access to, to the urban clientele while, there are, while others were not. So that this caused a lot of tension within Katukina villages. And then, of course, the story repeats itself. In 2008, there was a case of a death in Sao Paulo and 2009 in Chile. Of course, same with ayahuasca. We never know what happened. There's no autopsy. There's this big sensationalistic headlines. Everybody's panicking. Everybody's freaking. So that's like a 10 year of intense move uh, around Cambo. And then this whole idea that uh, it's very interesting in Acre because it's a way like, Instead of you calling somebody a ba bad name, you say, ah, Bill Pirata, he's a buyer parrot. It's like a category of <laughs> accusation. And so Cambo uh, navigates within this realm of symbols, of ideas, of disputes, of controversies, of negotiations. And of course, as I ask, it's followed by its process of internationalization. A, and there's Cambo in Australia. This is, uh, this is the New York Times journal, uh, 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 news. Poisonous tree frog could bring wealth to tribe in Brazilian Amazon. Okay, now some, some this is a little bit where I, I contribute uh, with my specific expertise, which is trying to understand what is going on in urban city centers. So Cambo in urban centers can be understood under two main lines 
of a classification. This is my theory, people, please <laughs> discount. This is my view. Probably you get different explanations. On the one side, it's a shamanic power plant or a remedy of the soul. It's to uh, bring this spirituality, connectness, relation to nature. What is, what is stressed and what is valued in this shamanic power plant like ayahuasca, like peyote? One aspect that it's indigenous and it comes from the Amazon forest. Those are two things that are appreciated and cherished about uh, Cambo. Then the other, uh, all this is related to what I talk a little bit about ayahuasca as well. It's related to this famous important binary combination, binary no, like uh, double. The Indian, the nature is powerful, is healing, is mysterious, it's wild, it's dangerous. And then on the other side, so the counterpart of this discourse, not the counterpart, but a following complementary aspect is that it's also seen as a kind of medical drug or a remedy of science. And here it's the biomedical properties that are valued. And this is a little bit the first slide that I jumped, which is the whole creation of a narrative, uh, scientific narrative to legitimize, which migrates to this new age context in a diffuse way that people are always saying things like, well, science already proved or scientists are working on that. And here, uh, what is val valued is the properties, this idea of the uh, pharmacology, the substance, vague scientific aspects of the benefits for the immun immunological system. So it's very common to say, Cambo is a remedy for uh, immunological system. And like in Alex's uh, PhD that I read recently, the draft, uh, there is this whole like also scientific uh, computer language discourse. It uh, helps me reset my hard disk or download this, uh, which is uh, ways that we classify, understand the world. So what are the continuities and discontinuities between the context of Cambo? in Catuquina uh, or Pano villages and in, ur in urban centers. Summarizing what I said before, there is both a process of medicalization of Cambo, of make making it uh, like a, a, a remedy, and of shamanization. Why am I saying shamanization? Because as I told you, Cambo traditionally, it's not uh, in the field of expertise of the shaman, it's not secretive, and it's not an expertise in itself. It's dependable on the moral qualities of a person. It's, uh, so you can't have an expert in itself in applying it. It depends on this relationship. So this is what I'm calling, we are calling shamanization. And then there is this process of translation or uh, making a kind of cultural translation or equivalent. Panema is reinvented as the Indian's depression. So frequently when this uh, new age or holistic clinic will give the lectures, they will start saying, well, when the Indians are depressed, they take Kambo. And this is how this thing spread and go out and become in the internet and everybody repeats it. And I think the job of the social scientist is trying to understand those things. And so here we have this uh, interesting like uh, contrast. On the one side, the Katukina idea of laziness, and on the other side, our idea of active principles. Now, this is what I think is the coolest insight of all of this. <laughs> I think so. So if originally you had this idea that you, you transmit your moral qualities, like if you're an old woman experienced has a husband, a family, and have gone through all that, and you can give this, pass these moral qualities to the younger person. And th so you transmit together with the substance this moral aspect. This is completely like, in a way, lost, but in another way, replaced and re-put into play. Why? Because it is as, as if by receiving a combo from indigenous person, you receive the moral qualities of that Indian. So within the urban context, there is a kind of replication of that same principle. The non-indigenous person who receives application from an Indian acquires the moral qualities of the Indian. 
Then there is this whole discussion about what was the Cambo pro, uh, project. This is also a little bit a side reflection, more on like public policy and stuff like that. As I said, it was the Katukina's initiative to the Ministry of Environment. So they proposed to make this super cool top uh, pioneer project involving anthropologists, molecular biologists, doctors, herpetologists. My co-author, co Edilene, she was invited to join this group. It was the times of Governo Lula, Lula government, and Marina Silva, this woman from Acre, uh, that comes from a very humble family that was rubber tapper in origin, brown skin, uh, roots, uh, was, you know, put in the Ministry of Environment and was this all excitement that was lost afterwards. Uh, that we're going to do something different and it's time of the forest people and it's time of the underprivileged. So we're going to put together this research project, this big uh, pilot project to promote the shared profits, shared profits between Indians and scientists from the genetic patrimony of Cambo. So that was a very interesting project, kind of unique and pioneer. What were the challenges of this project? to define what is traditional use. And then, of course, internal dispute between different ethnicities. Also frequent uh, sort of problem, like who owns this? It's something that is used by different in indigenous people. You're gonna create uh, a medicine out of it, and you're gonna re-give, re re give back to these people, so who? All the 10 groups? Is there a group that uses more, that knows more, that is more the legitimate representative of that? And then the fight start. So basically, it had a high, uh, it sort of became the symbol of a, an idea. So there were, it became something very big that had high expectations and perhaps an unrealistic time frame. But to the end of the day, even if the Indians had many issues and got into conflicts between themselves, what really made a difference was that the project failed due to the scientists refused to recognize traditional population's contributions. So the scientists involved said, well, we're going to develop this medicine and now we're going to share that with the Indians. No. So it was a very frustrating thing because there was this whole excitement, this whole promise, and it died. Then the, the federal police starts to develop this test to identify Cambo. It also became, fall into this uh, big category of drugs. So. It's attributed uh, to, to danger or to smuggling and those kind of things. Going back to the Amazon, what happened? What this expansion brought us? Oh, non-indigenous interest from people like us has raised indigenous interest. It's what Ejilene said. When she was there doing her field work, Cambo was not a big deal. When she returned more recently, it was all about Cambo. And then, it's this thing that I've been pointing out, emergency of the, com the category, Cambo expert. <laughs> the, the person who's expert in, in, in applying Cambo, in this case, any Katukina Indian, independent of his moral qualities, so to be, uh, to be indigenous was already good enough kind of expertise to be this Cambo specialist to apply outside. And of course, people go like to abroad, People have no clue of this sort of thing. They're coming and seeing the Indian applying. Actually, Cambo became a Katukina ethnic symbol. This is a Katukina Association of Campinas, it's normal of, of a village, have arrows, ting, ting, and a frog. So the Cambo sort of started to be reappropriated by the Katukinas after this big raise in interest as a kind of uh, ethnic symbol, diacritic symbol, and to what we call culture. Culture with uh, aspas, with, uh, how do you say, uh, quote, quotations, uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's our idea of culture. Almost culture as an object that you can consume. It's related to also what I mentioned in my talk, this idea of this objectification of culture. It's when indigenous people understand our representations about culture and start to using those categories to represent themselves, which is not part of their culture. It was something they did. 
or the same thing as like the people who sing hymns in the Amazon of Santo Daime, that's what they do. Know how to cook beans, know how to sing songs, play, do this and that, and then with this foreign interest, this becomes a kind of expertise, a symbol of our culture and this sort of thing. Further, uh, Cambo became a, uh, had a role as a mediator in local indigenous politics. Why? Because the Katukina had, have little power in the Acre context. Like they were this tribe that had a, like a road crossing right in the middle of their territory and they were weak players, social actors within Acre politics. And through the interest in Cambo, that kind of gave them a sort of identity and power in negotiating relationships with other Indians. And then, interestingly, other groups that didn't use Cambo, like the Nukini, the Ponawa, and Arara, start, restart to use. And then you have Indians in the northeast of Brazil, very far away from the Amazon, that have nothing to do with that, that start to use Cambo as well. So here, many parallels to what I was talking about ayahuasca yesterday. And this is where we have to think very thoroughly, I like this word, thoroughly, <laughs> uh, the, um, the ideas of authenticity and purity. This is uh, Nii, he also gave me some interviews. It was very cool, I, I interviewed this Katukina guy and he said, oh, this anthropologist think it's very interesting. I'm gonna go to this middle class uh, 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 buildings in Sao Paulo and I'm gonna knock in the door, I'm gonna say, hi, I'm an anthropologist, I wanna live here six months, uh, you know, kind of like, uh, all of this is knowledge built under a lot of tension, under a lot of negotiations, where basically as an anthropologist you get shit from everywhere. You get shit from, from the Indians, you get shit from the people that you interview, and you publish your papers and get criticized. But that's what is uh, interesting about this, this profession. So this is a path to healing in search of our internal nature, internal and divine nature. So you have this kind of flyer that says, for example, that the Indians use Cambo to be in harmony with nature. These are ob obviously completely external categories. Now I'm coming towards my, con my conclusions, trying to make some general reflection or claim under this laboratorial look of a new substance. What does that teach us about drugs? Famous discussion, set, set, and intoxication. First of all, as we all know, any drugs has some sort of ambiguity. On the one side, it can be a poison, it can be a remedy, or it can be a drug. This is uh, in the very orange of the word uh, uh, pharmacon, which is part medicine and part uh, poison. It depends on the context and it depends on the dose. And in this case, it has, it has also, so there is the symbolic dimension about symbols and classifications and this kind of danger, but there is also a concrete danger with uh, confusing it with other species because there are actually some frogs that if you use that, it's very intoxicating and you can die. So it's a confusion on how to classify or whether it's a drug or a medicine, but it's also a real serious concern on whether you're getting the right frog. I'm trying to say that Cambo is a good example to think set and setting the use of drug. Why? Traditional uses of Cambo help us think the ways we deal with drugs and our legal and biomedical classifications. What I have been saying is that Cambo was placed naturally under our mental classifications. We classify substances in certain ways. That's the grammar it's given to us. When we want to describe a psychedelic experience or describe a car, we have a certain language, we have concepts. So Cambo was classified in what in our categories we understand as kind of shamanic. And maybe what it's interesting is to try to understand other ways of classification. What do other groups and populations, how do they classify, how do they combine, how do they explain, how do they conceptualize the way, substances? And then maybe we have new paradigms and we can learn with them. 
and we can rethink our own categories and classifications. And I think Cambodia is a great example. In other words, maybe there is some benefits of intoxication. For us, the very word intoxication is negative. It gives all these ideas, these words, this or hallucinogen, or it's it's like disease. It's pathological. It's artificial. It's tricky. It's uh, fake. It's unreal. And intoxication is bad. But if we look traditionally, intoxication, for example, Glenn Shefford points interestingly that among the Machiganga group in the Amazon, kipigari means toxic or poison. So the shaman is called seripigari, into intoxicated with tobacco. So the fact of being intoxicated is actually considered positive and can be a space uh, for healing or for wisdom or for communicating with other realms, for mediating the relationships between human and non-humans. Conclusion, uncodependency. I'm saying here as a matter of conclusion, there is a co-relationship and co-dependency between animals, plants, and human beings. A co-dependency, it's all connected. So there is this story in the Amazon that if you don't take the frog, you know, in a nice way, and you just are cruel, and you don't, don't, uh, you're mean to the frog while you're extracting the poison, maybe a snake bites you. That's what the Indians say. Do it pro properly, because or else you're going to get bit by a snake. And then I was trying to look for information with biologists, which I think is an awesome thing that anthropologists never do. Uh, it's very challenging, this interdisciplinary thing. Everybody say they do, but it's very hard. And then I found out the sukuru, that's the scientific name of this uh, snake, uses kambo venom to produce its own venom. So why? Because the kambo is kind of a, like a slow frog. Phosphorant and slow doesn't move very fast. So what does the kambo use as a defense? When a snake come get the kambo, the kambo like pretends he's dead. There is a word for that, very like some complicated term. And then the snake bites, whoops, eats the kambo. And when the kambo gets inside the snake, the kambo spells the venom. And, and then the snake, spells the kambo back, so that's his defense. But she uses part of this venom uh, to produce her own, her own venom. Uh, so perhaps there is, you know, the idea that the Indian says that the snake will bite you if you don't respect the kambo, perhaps they are referring to this biological connection between these two species. Drugs have a role in communication between human and non-human beings, between humans and non-humans, between human beings, sorry, between us, with non-humans, and with nature. And then I just want to say, uh, end by saying how challenging it is uh, to classify all this and how we have to be delicate and soft uh, while interpreting this complex cultural phenomenon because there's other things which I came across doing the same, uh, prepare this lecture, which is the recreational use of snake bite. So some, apparently in India, some ninja, um, um, I don't know the name, ninja people that train the snakes, they, they, they train the snakes, they have this uh, ability. And there are some people that apparently look up this expert and try to get snake bites because they wanna have like abuse of snake bites. So there's this one paper with five cases of snake bite abuse in India. But also like a portion of those people were opioid dependent people. So are they looking for the snake bite as a sort of relief for their opiate dependence? Is this a drug? Is this a medicine? Thank you.